the concept of we call virtue ethics or this title, the title of this particular course or this series of lectures is called the Introduction to Islamic Virtue Ethics. Now, I often, when I speak about this particular topic, in particular with regard to this, with respect to this particular title, uh, when I call something virtue ethics, I like to make a distinction between what we would say, uh, it says the difference between an act of good or an evil act and what we call a disposition that an individual acquires or develops in light of those acts or multiple acts. And sometimes the, the disposition we develop we call, is, is a vicious disposition, which we call vice. And then other times the disposition we acquire is a good or a virtuous disposition, which we call virtue. And so a person may do a good act, uh, but doing a good act doesn't necessarily make you a good person. And you may do a bad act, but doing an evil act or bad act doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. Rather, being a good or a bad person, according to this understanding of the human being, uh, it means fundamentally when an individual actually has the inclination towards good, even when he or she does not have the opportunity to do so, and you're being a bad person or a vicious person, you're an individual who is inclined towards evil things, even when you do not have the capacity to do so, the opportunity to do so. And so, so when we study this particular science, uh, which has many different names, the most popular of those names being Tasawwuf or Sufism, as we know is a controversial term and a controversial concept because there's many different types or ways of seeing Sufism and uh, there are certain negative things definitely, definitely associated with Sufism and the Sufis. However, that being the case, uh, the essence of what it is is totally consistent with Islam. If not, it is not an aspect, it's not to say it is not an aspect of Islam. It is definitely an aspect of the religion of Islam. Whilst with the Prophet um, in response to the question by the angel, uh, tell me about excellence, akhbirni an ihsan, he responded, and ta'budullaha ka'annaka tara. It is for you to worship or serve God as if you see him. And if he doesn't see you, if you don't see him, then there's no doubt he sees you. So it means that either you, when you act, you act as if you really sense the presence of your creator at every single moment. That is to say, as if you're looking at your creator. You see your creator looking at you, or at least you feel that your creator is looking uh, at you. We call this the maqam of muraqaba. And so this is sort of the goal for us to reach a point where we act in accord with the divine wisdom, according with the, the divine, divine intent, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, so an act is one thing, a virtue is something different. Um, and studying this particular science, behavioral science, purification of the soul, the refinement of the soul, many different things that you, it is called Imm al Tahdib al-Nafs, Tahdib al-Akhlaq, Tazkid al-Nafs, Tasawwuf, so many different things, at ihsan so many different names that have been given to it, that we begin, as Muslims in particular, um, with an understanding that our assumption is that we have a fundamental human nature, that we have a fundamental human nature. And when I talk about human nature, I'm just not, and I'm just talking about physiology, that, you know, the, physiologically, of course, there are certain things that happen within our bodies, and all of us have things happen within our bodies, and of course, we say those things are part of our nature. Rather, we believe that behavior and emotions, they fall within the realm of human nature. That is to say that if we are not 
acting in accord with the divine intent right now, that our nature is for us to eventually be acting in accord with it. That Allah created us with a particular end in mind. And so our hope is that we will eventually reach that end. So in being uh, a person on the spiritual path, of being a person of Islam, we believe that we are constantly becoming something more than what we are. We're growing into something. And if we feel that there's no more growth, then that is a very dangerous place for us to be. Because as long as we are breathing, as long as we are in this world, um, there's always more awareness that we can achieve. There's more growth that we can achieve while in this world. And once we feel that there's no further, uh, um, there's, there's, there's a threshold that we've met, we've met that threshold, then that is a very dangerous place to be. We are attempting to perfect our humanity. So this is why I say, and as others have said in other traditions as well, that virtue ethics, or the aim of virtue ethics is uh, to teach the human being how to be good at being human, to teach the human being about uh, 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 being to, to how to be good at being a human being. You know, so we are becoming something. So this is one of our assumptions that we're working with. Of course, many people don't agree, agree with this, especially in the day and the time we live in. This idea that there is a human nature beyond physiology and biology. You know, that many people don't believe that anymore. But we do believe it. We assert that there is a human nature. And just because we may not be fulfilling or acting in accord with the perfection of our humanity, that it does not mean that Allah, the subhanahu wa ta'ala, does not want us or does not intend us, or does not create us with the purpose or the goal of us uh, becoming full and complete in accord with that particular divine plan. Now, this particular text, the text that we have been utilizing for this course um, is um, a poem uh, written by a Moroccan scholar from about 400 years ago, known as Abdul Wahid ibn Asha. Uh, who is, is a very famous poem today. Uh, it is a poem which um, deals with the three pivotal topics of Islam. The one, the area of creed. The second, the area of praxis. And then third, the area of, we call here, virtual ethics. And so, and in one sense, virtual ethics is also a type of praxis. Uh, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, uh, when he speaks about the different sciences of Islam, he says that, for one, the sources of Islam are, are two. One is the Quran, the other is the Sunnah. You know, but the, there are two sciences that, that relate to the Quran. One is the knowledge of Qira'at, and the other is Tafsir. So the, so the different modes of recitation uh, of the Quran, and then also exegesis. You know, with regard to the Sunnah, there are two sciences that can, are connected with the Sunnah. The one we call usul, usul, uh, usul al-fiqh, uh, and then uh, the furu al-fiqh, the, um, the uh, jurisprudential principles, and then the branches, or the sort of particulars of law. And so then he goes on to say that in reality, at the sawwuf, what I'm calling virtual ethics, um, is simply, it falls under the, the category of praxis, because realistically, the difference between what we typically would call fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, and tasawwuf is that the, the, the more um, normative fiqh is, we call fiqh al-zahir, the jurisprudence of the exterior, the jurisprudence of the outward, whereas tasawwuf is fiqh al-batin, it is the jurisprudence of the interior. It is, the, it, is, it, is the, it is the interior of the human being. And so that is fundamentally what it is, what it is and what it is all about, right? And um, while we may perform our prayers, we may fast Ramadan, we may do all the things that we expected to do, you know, but if we do them without, uh, without the right um, um, state of mind, the right sort of intention, the right presence of heart, then none of those things mean anything. So Tosov is in an attempt to help us to rectify uh, the state of our hearts uh, and our relationships, uh, which, um, which results after um, um, our every impulse. 
insha'Allah. Now, Ibn Abdul Wahib ibn Asha, he, he, he titles this chapter, he calls this chapter, he calls it Mabadi at Tasawwuf wa Hawadi et Ta'arruf, which translate as the principles of Sufism and the things guiding to the divine acquaintance. Right? And another way you can, you can translate this is as when we look at Mubadik, a Mabda is a principle, it is a place where something starts. The term Tasawwuf, you know, it, many scholars have differed about what the etymological roots of it are, but according to standard um, Qiyas, Lughawi, uh, sort of linguistic uh, analogy for you based on the standard sort of form, forms and constructs of the Arabic language, it will be in the Western tradition we call the fifth form uh, um, masdar, a verbal noun, right? And, and so it is connected with the word suf, which means wool. Uh, and the early ascetics and mystics of Islam, they were prominently known for wearing wool. And if you know wool, especially when it's directly against your skin is very coarse and harsh and difficult for one to wear wool and feel comfortable on a regular basis. And so, so tasawwuf in one sense means to put on wool. So, so mabadi at tasawwuf, one way you could translate it is as the, the places where we, the, the points where we begin to put on wool. That is to say, uh, if we give this a, a, a figurative uh, a translation or interpretation, it is to say, where do we start making ourselves feeling uncomfortable? Where these are the points, where is, where these are parts, these are points where we cause discomfort to ourselves. You know, so to soul is all about all those things that we typically um, try to avoid dealing with. You know, the things that we know are there, constantly there, but they are hard for us to deal with. And so, Mabadi Tasawwuf wa Hawadi from Hadin, Al Hadi, a guider or a guide. Hawadi, a ta'arruf, and those things that will guide to acquaintance, the divine acquaintance, as becoming uh, uh, understanding our Creator. And so, when we study theology, we study theology, we study um, God. Uh, some what we saw deductively, that is to say, or the attributes of God deductively. You know, we're given these principles, we're given these ideas, and say God is this, God is that, God's not this, God's not that, and we just surrender to them without sort of, you know, having certainty that these things are true, right? But with the soul wolf, in one sense, you can look at the soul wolf as a way of doing theologically inductively doing it the other way around. That is to say, because every single one of us um, encounters the Creator on a regular basis, every single day, every single, mo every single moment of our lives. That, that yes, uh, there are expectations that our Creator has of us. Yes, there are certain types of prohibitions that we've been given but also we face tribulation from time to time. We face challenges in our lives. And so when we, when we approach these challenges with the understanding that every time I have a challenge, I have a sickness, I have a tribulation, I have a fitna, then I am also encountering the creator. Then, then after time, I develop a deeper understanding of the sunnah or the sunnah of my creator and how the creator deals with us, how he deals with me. Like, so theology, in one sense, you can see it as, okay, theology is like meeting a person, right? It's a, nice to meet you, you know, and I, and I describe, you know, look at, this is Ahmed, you know, Ahmed's red hair, you know, Yusuf Masu, you know, his glasses, his beard, you know, you, you, you learn things, right? And of course, that is not to say that when we study theology, we're learning physical descriptions of the creator, but, but it's, it's more like you meet someone. You meet someone, you know, you first, you know, you don't know if they're good or they're bad, right? But in, with the right type of reflection in the area of virtue ethics, then fundamentally what occurs is that each encounter is like spending time with that new friend, right? 
And at times, we may not trust the wisdom of that friend. We may not trust the wisdom of that friend. But as each moment will prove to us over a long time that we come to realize after a while that, you know what? That my friend is truly my friend. My friend will never let me down. My friend always wants the best for me. Even when I want something else, think of all the times you wanted something different and it really pained you. And you say, oh God, why can I not have it? <laughs> why? All right? But then after a while, Allah opens your eyes and makes you see this is why. This is why I was, I was, what I was protect, protecting you from. I'll give you an example of this from my own life. Very recent. Alhamdulillah, I just referred to her from Hajj. And, and we had arrived uh, on the day when the crane accident had occurred. We actually arrived before it happened. We, had, we, we came in, we were coming into Mecca, and it was a ride from, from Jeddah on the bus. And at a certain times during the trip, I just, I felt very impatient. I felt like, you know, let's hurry up. Come on. I want to hurry up and get to Mecca. I want to hurry up there so I can make umrah, so I can go to my hotel and rest because I'm tired, right? Yeah, why is this taking so long? And we, we, we make it to Mecca, and um, we get there right maybe an hour, hour and a half before Juma. Unfortunately, we can't make it, they won't allow us into the, uh, the courtyard of the masjid, Masjid Haram, which our hotel, where our hotel is. You know, because Juma is about to start, they block up the street. So we decide, well, we have to go pray Juma somewhere so we can waste some time. We'll pray Juma, and then after, if you go eat some, eat some lunch, and hopefully by that time, the road will be open. So we did all that. We headed back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the masjid. We get there, the road still closed. Alhamdulillah. One of the guards lets us in, in spite of all of it. So we head up to our hotel. We get there after this, we're exhausted. Originally, our plan was that we go straight to the masjid, do umrah, and then go rest. So we get in, we, just, we decide, okay, well, instead of us going to make umrah, we're going to go and rest. And slept, woke up, maybe around, you know, got up right around Maghrib time now. And now we go to the masjid to perform Umrah. Now, when we get to the masjid, we're supposed to go into Baba Salaam. We get to Baba Salaam, right at Baba Salaam, we see the crane up against the masjid, fell down. We had no idea what had occurred. We, know, we saw it was an accident. We said we hoped no one was hurt. But the point of it is that we believe is that if we had made Umrah at the time we originally planned to, we probably would have ended up in that, in that accident. Allah knows best, we see. But that's just one of those things, you know, you just, you just learn to kind of go with, with what Allah gives you after a while, you know, trust Allah's judgment, you see. Right? So, so, so this is fundamentally how this idea um, or this concept or this, this sort of reasoning goes. Now, another thing is that, you know, so while, yes, that we are becoming something, that we have a human nature, that we uh, as well have a story, that's another thing that we keep in mind that we should consider is that we have a story as human beings. And that story uh, is connected with what the Christians would call the fall from grace. And of course, we don't believe in the idea, of course, original sin, but there in one sense, there was somewhat of a fall in that we were our four parents, our parents were cast out of the garden and sent down to this earth with given the task to redeem them for themselves through Khilafah, through the stewardship of the earth and preparing others to be stewards of the earth. And um, so distance is created between the human being and the creator. And what creates that distance is sin. Uh, Adam's sin, alayhi salam, and Nuhawa, her sin, Eve's sin, alayhi salam, created distance, physical distance, not only spiritual distance, but physical distance from themselves and the creator. Of course, that is to say, we're, of course, not saying God has a particular position, a direction. I'm just saying, you know, Jannah, the abode, of course, uh, which is, in spiritual terms, considered to be 
uh, the abode that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves more than the others. Uh, so, so, and it's interesting that this distance that's created through sin, when we look at um, Sharif al-Jarjani's Kitab al-Ta'rifat, and he defines a sin, the word adham. He said, a sin is ma yahjubuka anillah. Ma yahjubuka anillah. A sin is what veils you from God. A sin is what veils you from God. That is his definition of sin. So every time we commit sin, of course, more veils of darkness and the veils become thicker. Uh, and say in the Quran, in Surah, um, surah uh, Mutafifin, in a number of different verses throughout the Quran, in this particular verse, Allah mentions, That what they would, would, were earning, it has created a type of veil or rust right, you know, uh, upon them, right, upon their hearts, a type of rust on their hearts has been created because of what they earn, right, so the sin itself can lead you into darkness, it lead you into, it is, can remove or make you less receptive of the divine light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so after this it says, كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَرَّبِّهِمْ يَوْمَ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ indeed, on that day, they will be veiled from their Lord, right, why? Because of what? What they've done. So it's interesting. So Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, when we think about this idea of the story, Ibn, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, he, he has a very interesting um, um, s number of, of reports that he mentions in his book, Lita'af al-Ma'arif. And he says that the Adam alayhi salam, after he had been cast down to the earth, he actually experienced remorse over what he did for about 300 years that it, it really bothers him. He felt guilt and remorse about it for 300 years. And so Ibn Rajab goes on to say, uh, you know, and, he had, and he deserved to feel that way. Why? Because he was in a, in a bold where he experienced no hunger, nor did even know he was egg, naked. There were no rules, right? Yeah. Didn't know he was naked. Nor did he experience any thirst or the extreme heat of the sun, right? And so it said, he goes on to say that, that every time the angel Gabriel, alayhi salam, would visit Adam, alayhi salam, that he would, um, he, would, he would cry. Adam would cry profusely. And he cried so much that the angel would cry. And then he would ask him, you know, wa ma yubkik? Ya Adam, ma yubkik? Why are you crying? And he would say to him, How or why should I not cry when I have been expelled from the abode of bliss into this abode of, of, of misery? Why should I not cry? Right? And so and in other, other narrations, in, in Sai Francis said sometimes he would cry and the children, they would ask him, why are we crying profusely? All this crying is hurting us. Why are you continuing to cry? He said, Inna ma abki ala jiwari rabbi. That I am crying because I am no longer in the proximity of my Lord. Fi darin turbatuha tayyiba. In an abode whose soil is good and rich. Asma'u fiha aswat al malaika. I can hear the sound, the voices of the angels in that place. Right. So why, why should I not cry? So this is part of, of that story, how sin distances us. You know? And so in, in, in order for us to, to um, of course, to redeem ourselves, then we've been given tasks in this world to be stewards of this earth. But Allah has given us tools as well to be good stewards. You know? And we have to gain mastery over ourselves. You know? And part of gaining mastery is understanding what we are and who we are. Imam Ghazali, and he talks about the human being, he he says that there are four basic traits in the human being uh, from which deeds originate. And so and he calls them, uh, respectively, he calls them the God trait, the Satan trait, the bestial trait, and the predatory trait. al khasla al rububiya wa shaytaniya wa sabu'iya wa bahimiya or bahim wa sabu'iya. So, so, so they originate from these. You know. So for instance, to give an example, the example of the God trait in the human being is like when we actually have the desire to be lords over other people, right? Arrogance comes from this particular trait. It's a natural thing within the human being, in his, in his, his view, 
you know, this nature that we have at a certain point we'll grow into having this desire to want to be lords over people, to be, to be, to be people uh, who look down upon others, among other things. People who want to be served by other people, the God trait. The Satan trait is a, is, a, is a trait of deceit and deception that we develop within ourselves. All of us become people of deceit at a certain point in our youth. Uh, the, the bestial trait is that most, of fun, most fundamental and the first of them to develop in any human being and a child, and that is that particular trait that calls us to, to indulge in our basic, our carnal lust and our appetites, among other things. Um, and the predatory trait uh, is the from which things, it is the trait from which things such as envy and resentment and other things, they originate. So to understand just how the sort of complex we are, you know, that that and how complex a human being is, is important for us uh, in our um, attempts to rectify our souls. Now, Imam, Imam, Imam Zaid, up to this point, he's been focused on just the first couple of verses of the, of the text, uh, known as Al-Murshid Ma'in, Ala Dururi Min Ulum al And I'll just read the, those, those little verses just as a, just to uh, sort of um, somewhat to summarize a little bit of what we've already covered. He said, وَتَوْبَةٌ مِّنْ كُلِّ ذَنْبٍ يُشَّرَمْ تَجِيبُ فَوْرًا مُطْلَقًا مَحْيَ النَّدَمْ بِشَرْتِ الْإِقْلَاعِ وَنَفِي الْإِصْرَارِ وَيَتَلَافَ مُمْكِنًا ذَسْتِكْفَارِ So repentance from every sin committed is compulsory immediately and absolutely. And it is defined as regret with the condition of discontinuing the sin and not repeating the offense. And let one make amends with others when possible. This is truly seeking forgiveness. Or let the one seeking forgiveness um, um, uh, do so in this fashion, depending on how we translate it. Uh, there's more than one way to, to translate that, that part of the, of the verse. So basic toba, repentance. And it is interesting, too, that the word toba comes from the Arabic word taba, which is synonymous, synonymous with the word return. It means to return, right? And almost every other word in the Arabic language, which uh, translates as repentance, also means to return. Inaba, meaning it comes from a word which means to return. And oba, it comes from a word that means to return, right? So where are we returning to? Inna lillahi wa na ilayhi raji'un, right? Where we verily, we are... Uh, we belong to God, and rarely we are returning to God. So our attempts in this life, before we return to Allah physically, that we attempt to return to Allah spiritually, that we are trying to return to our innocence that we once enjoyed while we are in this world. And so it is an obligation to repent from every single sin, from every single sin, and to do so immediately, be that sin major or be that sin minor. minor. And then that's not even talk about the question of is there such thing as major or minor sin? The scholars actually differ about over the issue. Most of them say there is, of course, some, some sins that are major and others are minor. But there's some argue say, no, a sin is only major with comparison to what is of less severity uh, than it. Uh, that is, so all sin will be major. So we don't belittle any sin that we commit. But of course, we know that certain sins are, uh, are not as easy uh, to overcome as others. Some are easier to overcome than others. Sins with the eyes are difficult to overcome. Sins of the ear is difficult to overcome. You know, but sins with the hands, the feet, and other things, they're easier to overcome. Um, even the sin of the tongue, according to certain scholars, you know, is dif they're difficult to overcome, like backbiting. This is why in the Shafi'i school, backbiting is just a minor sin as opposed to a major sin, whereas in the Maliki school, it's a major sin. Now, don't, the sin, again, don't belittle sin. <laughs> Don't belittle sin. Any sin, uh, even the smallest one, can become a, a more significant one. So we have to be very careful about that. You know, this is simply, it's just a, an opinion. We don't want to meet Allah and find out the opinion that we were wrong, right? You know, so we just take the safer paths in this one and say, yeah, backbiting is major. It's probably the better position to take. Right, so, so an individual has to experience remorse, Toba, true toba, you know, it begins with remorse over what one does. You know, the, 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 your heart aches. Your heart aches. Ta'allam al-qalb, you know. It, it aches at what, what occurs. That's, that is the first thing, the first step. But that is, itself is not 
sufficient. It is the most important part of repentance, but it's not sufficient. For instance, let's say a person, a person actually, um, let's say you get lung cancer because you smoke cigarettes, for instance, for, for a number of years. Now, naturally, there's going to be remorse, right? Once you discover you had lung cancer, right? right? But that particular remorse is not necessarily tova, right? Because I, I just found out that I'm going to die soon or something like that, or I might die, right? And, and I feel, definitely I feel bad about that, about what I've done to myself, but that not necessarily repentance because, because uh, uh, if the only reason that I feel remorse is because I hurt myself, right, then that in, it, that in itself is not, the, the repentance should be directed towards your creator, that your repentance is because I offended my creator, right? That's fundamentally uh, what needs to be kept in mind. You know, so repent is remorse, but then also that one refrain that you stop what you are doing wrong. That's the second step. Right, so especially when the sin is against the creator or against your own soul, but then sometimes the sin can be against another person. And I'm quite sure Imam Zay talked about this. And so when the sin is against the other person, there's another step that needs to be taken, a step of uh, perhaps even we call reparations in some particular regards, uh, that you know, if you sold someone's property, you give it back. You know, if you broke someone's property, you pay for it, you have it repaired, among other things. You know, you have to put your old person in debt. You have to pay their debt. This is why the Hajj, it forgives, it removes sin, but not debt. Right? It removes all your sin, but your debts, you know, you still have to pay your debts. Um, or when we think about um, becoming Muslim, like a lot of people, you know, become Muslim, and then people tell me, yeah, alhamdulillah, you have a clean slate now. All your sins are forgiven. Now, some people mistakenly think that it means that anything I did to people in the past, they have no right to call me to task <laughs> for it anymore. Now, if you murdered someone yesterday and then you became Muslim today, then they have every right to put you in jail or do whatever, you know, that, that they feel is necessary uh, within the context of, of justice, right, to you. You know, if you stolen someone's money or if you hurt someone, right, you know, physically, if you, if you beat your wife or whatever, you know, that becoming Muslim today Yes, God may forgive you, right, for some sins, but these are violations against human beings. And so a person has every right to demand justice in this world for what you've done to them physically, uh, financially, and, and otherwise. Right, so, so that's just a summary of that particular section. And so the next section we're going to go, go into is the section of dealing with the concept of taqwa. Now, toba is the foundational maqam, the foundational station of certitude, that it is where everything begins, that when we are trying to um, become better people, we're trying to return to that state of innocence, we're trying to make amends with our creator, it begins and ends with toba. That toba is the state, the most important of all states to be in, that we be constantly in the state of toba, and, and, and we should pursue that state because Allah says in the Quran, in Allah, you hit tawabin or you hit mutatahirin. Allah loves those who are in a state of repentance. If you want God's love, then be people of Toba, be in a state of repentance. And if we, and we shouldn't ask for forgiveness in general. If we know there are specific sins that I committed, right, right then I should ask Allah. In particular, for that as well, say so that Allah, I, please forgive me for the time I punched that guy in his nose for no reason. Right? Yeah, whatever. You, you, you understand that? Ask specifically. You say, Allah, forgive me for all my sins. Right? No, specifically, because it has a deeper impact on you as well. It creates uh, um, you know, because because what can happen is you continue to love those things you did which were evil in the past. Right? You continue to love them, and if you continue to love them, there's more likely the opportunity, a chance that you may fall into them once again out of weakness. You see, you know, so we should seek to overcome uh, or seek forgiveness from from all of those particular things. So toba is the most important of all of them, and it, we're going to be coming back to toba over and over and over. And so he goes on. He says, "Wahasi lo takwish ni nabun mantithal fi zahirin wa batinin bidatuna." وجاءت الأقسام حقا أربعة وهي للسارق السبل منفعة 
The summary of God consciousness, a taqwa, is avoiding sin and complying to his commandments. A taqwa is a word which originates from the verb waqa yaqi waqayatan, which means to shield oneself. So a person's mutaqi, a person who is God conscious, a person who is pious, that individual, he is or she is shielding him or herself from what will harm him or herself in the hereafter. Right? That you are shielding yourself from what will harm you in the hereafter. So you're shielding yourself from the punishment of hell. You're shielding yourself from the, uh, the regrets of sin, among other things. So, so taqwa is fundamentally that. And, it is, and, and there's no such thing as us repenting to God while not trying to rectify our behavior. If not, without trying to become better people. And taqwa is extremely important in that when we read the Quran, you get the impression from the Quran that that taqwa is an essential light that one requires in order to fully grasp the, the divine wisdom. Right. Now the Quran has been revealed as a guidance for humanity. Shahrul Ramadan alladhi unzila fi Quran nas that it is revealed as a guidance for humanity, all humanity. However, in Baqarah, Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدَلْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That that or this is the book wherein there is no doubt a guidance for al-muttaqeen, the God conscience. And it mentions, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِينَ and we reveal from the Quran what is a cure and a mercy for the believers. A mercy for who? For the believers. And it only increases the wrongdoers in loss and in ruin. That's what it says. Reading the Quran will increase some people in ruin. There's yet some people who actually read the Quran. They don't read it with any intention for guidance. But it leads them astray. It makes them worse than what they were. But others who read it with an open heart, with an open mind, seeking closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those people are brought close and they get deeper understand. There's some people that have hearts by which they don't understand. And they have, they have eyes by which they don't see. Right? It's not their eyes they don't see, it is their hearts and their breasts, right? Their hearts and their chest, they know that's, you, know, you understand? So there's a, see, we see the heart sees, right? And so in order to understand the divine secrets and the divine wisdom, you have to be a person of taqwa, you have to pursue taqwa. So he goes on to say that, what is taqwa? What does it mean? What is it taqwa? So taqwa, in summary, it is avoiding sin, and complying to God's commandments. Right, so taqwa is sort of like an active now, right? God consciousness is an action as opposed to just simply a state. So, so it's like God has given me certain things I'm supposed to do. Yeah, be truthful, be honest, be charitable, um, pray your five prayers. Fast Ramadan, make the Hajj if you have capacity. Give 2.5 percent of your well, of your annual savings, right? Among so many other things, certain things you have to do. You fulfill those commandments, but then there are also things you have to avoid. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't fornicate, don't backbite, right? Among other things, and it's easier to fulfill God's commandments than to avoid God's prohibitions. It's easier to fulfill the commandments than to avoid the prohibitions. You think you agree with that or no? It's easier to, I, I tell you, go, go pray for, for units of prayer. Yeah. If I say, uh, tell, I, if, but if I say to you, don't gossip or don't listen to gossip, which one's easier to do? 
Yeah. Easier to pray, right? Right? In spite of that, the prophet told us, uh, Whatever I forbid you from doing, then don't do it. Abandon it. And whatever I order you to do, do from it whatever you're able to do. It doesn't mean that, well, I can only pray two instead of five prayers. No, it doesn't mean that. It's talking about beyond the compulsory things. That if I tell you to do something which is good, then do it as much as you're able to do it. Like, for instance, maybe tahajjud, maybe giving charity beyond your compulsory um, zakat, right? Um, do as much as you're able to do. But he didn't give you, that condition wasn't mentioned when he said avoid things, don't do things. Not tell you not to do something, he said don't do it, period. Just don't do it. He didn't give any leeway. Does that mean we don't fall into, fall into sin? We're still, we're still falling into sin out of weakness. We still do it. But we still, we fall down, we get up. Fall down, we get up, continue to do it. So, so it is avoiding sin and complying with his commandments outwardly and inwardly. Outwardly and inwardly. That achieves it. And so it says, the divisions of taqwa and truth have come as four. They are for the traveler and paths toward true, they are the travel, for the traveler, the paths towards true benefit. Right, so the categories, the types of, the taqwa is of four types. One is internal compliance. Two is external compliance. So internal compliance meaning that that when I do an act, that I do it with the right intention and I do it with sincerity. Right? And if I haven't done it with the right intention and sincerity, then I continue to work on it. Hopefully, one day it will happen. So we pray so much, pray five times. You know, how many times have you actually had a full prayer where you completely focus every single second of the prayer? Very few people can say that they're ever able to do so, but we continue to try and we try and we try and we try and we try. Right? Have focus, have sincerity, presence of heart, right? Nia. So internal compliance, that is what God is calling us to. Uh, you know, that they've been ordered to worship and serve, serve God, being sincere to Him in religion. Even though I don't like religion for deen, but that's the best word I can think of at the moment. You know, so, so that is internal. And then there's external compliance. So, for instance, you follow the rules. There are regulations given to you. This is how you approach God. This is how you pray to God. If so, why we have to follow? Like God said, do it. We just do it. You know, He said this. This is the way that you gain closest to Him. We do it on the basis of that. Yeah. Well, I don't understand why I do it. Well, you don't have to understand everything. God expects you to to obey. You know, and to do what you need to do. Now that's different than okay. You know, when someone's life is in, in, in stake. You know, where if it's like, well, I just I'll kill them because. I understand that this God told me to do it, and even though it seemed like it may not be right, I'm going to kill. No, it's different. You know, when we're talking about this basic worship and ritual, you know, you say, you know, pray four here, pray two, pray three, right? Do these out loud, do these audibly, uh, inaudibly. We don't, you know, we just do it. You know, wear this, dress like this, don't dress like that. Yeah, you know, we, you know, we do things. You know, eat this, don't eat that. You know, we do it because God has ordered to do so. And there is an elevation in our spiritual ranks or a real spiritual status when we comply, right? So, so that is the first. The first is inward compliance, outward compliance. But then the other two are inward avoidance and outward avoidance, right? So, so refraint. So, so it's this actually um, omission. So there's, you know, acts, but then also an omission as well, which is an aspect of taqwa. So, so if, if, if God said, don't drink wine, right, if somebody offers me wine, I say, well, no, right? I might even have the appetite for it. Some people might, sometimes they're Muslim alcoholics, they, they exist. Yeah. Or just people who, who just have, have had wine before and they just like the taste of wine, right? You know, and they still have somewhat of a desire for it. So you go, no, that in itself is an act of taqwa, right? So avoiding it, but then it's, always, so again, the same thing with the intention. Why did I avoid it? Yeah, I might, I may not, I didn't want to accept the gift from you. You know, I, I might, you know, you, you give, we gave me wine, but I don't, I don't like you, so I don't want, I don't want you to think like you, I owe, you owe me, you owe me something. 
I owe you something, you know, because you gave me a glass of wine. No, I'm not going to. That may be a reason why somebody rejected it. But if your reason for objecting it is because it, this, is, this is God, it's displeasing to God, you know, it can be harmful to my intellect, especially uh, after a uh, um, significant amount of uh, uh, consumption of it. You know, so, and I do it lila. Yeah. So those, that's uh, the, other, the other thing. So, so I figured that um, that will be all that we'll cover for today. I think that that should be sufficient, right? Okay, so if there are any questions, then um, inshallah, I'll open up the floor to you and um, hopefully I can address whatever uh, concerns you have, inshallah. Now, the difference between istighfar and tawbah. Istighfar means talab al to ask for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness could be for a number of different reasons. That doesn't really necessarily mean that I truly am remorseful. Toba has uh, the element of remorse in that, you know, um, you know, I actually acknowledge that there's something wrong that I did. People ask for forgiveness all the time. They don't do it because they necessarily feel that they did anything wrong. They did it because they want to, they just don't want to deal with all the noise anymore. You know, people will say, well, you know, sometimes married people do that. <laughs> something, not me, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> but um, um, you just want peace. So, yeah, sorry, okay, sorry. Forgive me, right? Um, people can do that and ask forgiveness. Now, of course, with God, sikvar, if you're asking God's forgiveness, then naturally is it there, the assumption is that I am acknowledging that something was wrong. Uh, but toba is a step a little bit, a step further. Toba is that, okay, I, 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 I decide that I will not return to this act again. Right. Well, a mustaghfir, the person actually asking forgiveness, may actually have an intention to return to the act later, you see. You know, ask for forgiveness now, you know. Or some, sometimes you find people actually will have a plan. You say, I'll do it now and ask for forgiveness afterwards. <laughs> you know, there, there is that intention that a lot of people often have. You know, say, I know it's wrong, but you know what? I'll just do Toba afterwards, you see. Yeah, I mean, again, the person who asks for forgiveness is not necessarily planning to return. I said the idea. But the point is that I mean, istighfar often is it is it is it, it is concomitant with toba. When people make toba, they also istighfar is a part of the process of making toba. You see, you know, so it's an aspect of toba. Uh, but I'm, what I'm saying is that 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 a person who asks for forgiveness is not necessarily acknowledging, or doesn't always necessarily acknowledge. That one is what one has done is wrong. You see, you know, in the general situation, you know. But we're here if we're talking about with God. Then I do think that it, we can reasonably assume that a person is acknowledging, making that acknowledgement. But Toba is a step further. It's more than just simply asking forgiveness. It's also making the decision not to return to the misdeed that one has done, and also feeling a sense of remorse about about the about the uh, the sin. Yeah. All right. Oh, are you talking? Okay, right. Yeah, these characteristics. These are human characteristics that Imam Ghazali he mentions. These are four basic traits, human traits. That, uh, they are the they are the source of all of our acts, the things from which our acts originate. You know, so they are. Uh, so he says we have the we call the satanic trait. There's the God trait. There's the uh, predatory and the bestial. Right. Right. So those four. So he said, "Why Toba is a, well, Taqwa is a higher state, higher state than Taqwa on um, Toba. Why Toba is a higher state of Taqwa? Um, well, Taqwa is, in, in one sense, is not necessarily a state, um, but of course, in another sense, it is. But Toba is uh, because it's defined as remorse, uh, along with the decision and resolve." not to return to sin. That fundamentally is describing a state of being. Whereas taqwa, when we look at its definition, is not describing a state of being, it's describing a, a type of resolve, for instance, right? 
you know, it's like a decision to avoid, a decision to comply. And through my compliance and through my avoidance of things, I am characterized as a person of taqwa because of that, you see. You know, now, uh, being a person of taqwa, it could be that in some respects, I am also a person of toba, right? Because when I am, uh, I am overcoming, I'm abandoning, if I'm abandoning something, right? And then I'm constantly avoiding it, then I have, I'm a person of taqwa as well. Right, but in other senses, in, in another sense, if I am just simply fulfilling a commandment given to me, I am not necessarily commit, I'm not make, repenting from from a particular thing. You see, so does that make sense? Right. So, I, that's what I I, I, I think is is virtue ethics. I, that's how you would pr probably translate to soul, in my in my opinion. You know, so so it's um. You have three basic types of ethics. Uh, I mean, when you learn ethics uh, in my modern institution, they, they, they'll tell you there are three basic types. There's what we call um, the deontology, which is the Kantian ethics, um, which the, uh, is duty-driven. That is to say that the, the, uh, that your moral state is determined by how well you act on your own principles. Uh, how, feel you, how, how well you live up to them, you know. So emotions and things like that are not part of that type of ethics, you know. Emotions and, and uh, appetites is not considered to be a part of that type of ethics. Um, so treat people as ends, not as means. Uh, so that's we call they call it the deontology, you know. So the goal is fundamental. It's a goal driven. Is a is a duty driven type of ethics. But then the second is we call consequentialism. It has a number of different subcategories, which in the old days we just call utilitarianism. But nowadays they say utilitarianism is just a subcategory of consequentialism. And when you're looking at the ultimate uh, uh, idea is that, you know, that, that you're ethical to the extent of the consequence of your actions or to the extent of how many people are benefited by your actions. You know, if the majority have benefited, you have proportionalism and things like that. So you have, um, 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 uh, that's another way of, um, another type of ethics, you see. Uh, um, so it's about the consequences of your actions, you know. So if the consequence is good, then there was a, an ethical act. If the consequence was bad, then the, then the action was, uh, was, um, was a bad act, you know. And of course, I'm extremely abbreviate, abbreviating all of this. There's a lot more to be said about it. And then thirdly is what we call virtue ethics. And where the virtue ethics, the aim of virtue ethics is uh, to become a better, uh, become a better person, right? So the goal is to improve on what you are, to become a better person. So we call it virtue ethics. To soul wolf is about becoming a better person, right? And so I believe that the, the proper translation of it is virtue ethics. And that's why I've utilized uh, that title for this particular course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Right, and the verse it mentions is about and it only increases the wrongdoers in loss. Uh, and that what happens with vulm or with sin is that that it, it darkens the person's light. It it, it darkens the individual's uh, in, um, ability to discern between right and wrong. And um, and in reading the Quran and in listening to any type of advice that will encourage them to do better and to change their ways, that the individual is, is, uh, is, is sort of led to a state where, where a, a proof is, is established against them. So for instance, um, you, get, you, get, you get this impression when you read the Quran that, that, um, that a certain, at a certain point, God closes the door on things. We call this the curse of God, la'natullah, sort of the al-ibad and rahmatullah, to become remote or distant from God's mercy. And, and so, so it's basically said that God will send signs and send warners, will send advisors to an individual over and over and over, and a person will know that what they're doing is wrong, but they refuse and refuse and refuse and refuse and refuse until at a certain point, God will say, you know what, that's it. So even if guidance comes to them, you know, they won't benefit from it. Uh, and um, so I, used to, I like to do this, uh, this um, sort of a, I don't know if you call it an analogy or illustration, you know, where I think of like 
uh, if we imagine hell and heaven as like these two sort of planets, right? And, and of course, planets have a gravitational pull. And, and when we just imagine ourselves between those two planets, individuals between those two planets, and, and when we do good, that the good itself is in, it's sort of a propulsion device. It pushes us in the direction of heaven. And evil is also a propulsion device. And, and when we do evil, it pushes us in the other direction, right? You know, but we get propelled so much and so close to that planet that eventually we get caught up in this gravitational pull. And, and even if we wanted to pull ourselves out of the gravitational pool of heaven, we couldn't even do so because God has befriended us, right? And the same thing said about the opposite, is that we get so close to the gravitational pull of planet hell, right? We get caught up in this gravitational pull that we can't pull ourselves out, right? Yeah, so, so sin, that's the effect of sin, of sin over and over and over and, 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 not, and people not repenting. Uh, and, and so basically, that type of individual, when he or she is reading things from the divine realm, right, uh, revealed law, you know, and the divine wisdom, that they see something different than other people who are reading it actually truly seeking advice. When they read it, they're not seeking, seeking guidance, those type of people. They're seeking to critique it. They're seeking to uh, dismantle it, to, de to deconstruct it, right, you understand? Uh, they don't. They don't really see any any good in it. They don't accept it as something of a divine origin to begin with. You see, and we have people like this in the world today. Uh, um, I personally feel that you know. And of course, you never say you don't know what person's state you know until they're dead. But I believe that I mean there are some popular voices out there who I would think that when seem to me when they read the Quran, they only see evil, right? You know, focus on verses about violence, or they you know, and, and they're constantly trying to bring this stuff out, you know, without reading the Quran within this historical context, within this as historical um, as um, right, this historical context among other things, you know. So, so this is fundamentally what is meant by that and other verses in the Quran. Does that help? Okay. Well, I mean, um, the 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 mainstream Sufis historically have they always begin. Um, uh, their, their discussions of, 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 of spirituality with theology, with like sort of um, orthodox theology would be like sort of the, where they begin. It's like the law itself, you know, they would begin to emphasize the importance of the law, right? But, you know, in order to, to, to validate or to authenticate their tesofuf, their tesofuf, you know, that, that if, if it wasn't validated by the law and it wasn't... Um, validated by the sort of the transmitted with sort of the dogma or the, the um, you know, the, the creed that was passed down, then they would consider it to be something uh, very dangerous for people to do to begin with. Now, and, uh, and some levels, Sufis had developed their own sort of theology, but, but the thing was about it was that there was focus so much on about this, this seeing God's creative and creative hand and, 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 and everything that happens, you know, in that sense, you know, they're trying to give meaning to, um, to every encounter, uh, and whereas theologians were not necessarily focusing on every single encounter, they're just focusing on, you know, that God exists, God is one, God is these attributes, you know, there are um, things of the unseen realm, the prophets they came, these are their attributes, among others. So that's fundamentally what, what, what would occur, you know. So, um, so it's more so like they're focused on God's personality as opposed to God's person, quote unquote, you see. Whereas um, normative theology is focused on God's person, you know, whereas the Sufis are focused on God's personality. Yeah. 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 Because you get a, a, a much broader sort of picture, you know, it's like, you know, you can't know the personality without knowing there's a person, right, as well. You know, again, and I'm using person in a more generic sense, not human being. I'm not mean that, like that. And those people uh, on, on, online or write and say, I'm not a Muslim anymore. I'm, uh, says some, something blasphemous, you know. But I'm using in a more academic type of way, you know. But God's entity, right, God is an entity, right. God is something that, that exists, 
you know, or Sufis would say that he is the only um, truly thing that exists, or we say the because his existence is not not contingent upon anything else, so his existence is real, you know, real existence. You know, whereas everyone everyone else's existence is contingent upon God saying that keep existing. Right? So, so I don't know if that fully answers your question. Perhaps you know we have a more detailed conversation in the office <laughs> later. So, yes, sir. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. No, his question was that how could how could um, regular theology inform um, our study of of, of Sufism? Because God made a point. I mentioned earlier that uh, I made the claim. I, I would say that that Sufism, in, in many different ways, is a, is a is is a study of theology inductively, an inductive study of theology, whereas normative theology is is deductive, right? So that's why I said make the distinction between, you know, studying God's person or personality, right? So Sufis would be concerned with studying God's personality, whereas the theologians would be concerned with studying God's person, you see, or, um, and, um, or God's entity, I guess we'll use a less controversial word. Um, so, um, so, so he was just asking, you know, is, um, how would studying one inform the other? Or might one form and form form the other, and so basically, I attempted to answer, give an answer that you know uh, I don't think it was completely satisfactory, satisfactory to him right now. But you know, hopefully, uh, uh, we'll, we'll work we'll work on it. Inshallah. <laughs> What's that? Four year process. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Well, so speak on the, uh, the 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 idea of remorse in time. You know, and so. Relationship between remorse and time, well, and as as in you know, if uh, could it could could too much time, um, I guess you'd say, suffering guilt for too too much too long time, could that be considered to be somewhat excessive, or in that sense, or? Uh, well, oh well. Well, I mean, again, it's the, of course, I mean, we, we, it, we, there's a belief that, of course, the earlier people, they live longer. And, um, and the, uh, Adams, what he was remorseful about was something I think we, we, we could not, none of us could really understand because you live in Jannah. I mean, you know, you live in Jannah, then you're back, when you're on this place here, and you have to, uh, you know, endure toil and, Tribulation, your son kills your son. Uh, I mean, you just, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a whole lot to be remorseful about, you know, to, to feel, you know, it's like, you know, why the heck did I do that? Why the heck did I eat that thing? You know, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, and knowing that that's your true home as well. It's like you've been cast out of your home, you know, and you don't know when you're going to return, you know, so, um, so I mean, in in terms of that particular story, I think it's uh, it's just something that, like, if true that it was that much time, then then you know, I I I think that you know that it makes sense that if he saw all the all of God's glory, I mean, you know, he he knew what 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 was there already, and um, and then to be expelled from that place is you know had to be extremely traumatic. Extremely, extremely traumatic, you know. Now, of course, people, there's some people who who will suffer, um, who have guilt, who carry guilt with themselves, and, and and some people, they say, okay, well, I can't forgive myself, and, you know, so there's some people who, who deal with those type of things as well uh, in their lives, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, it could be, it depends on what it is. Uh, let's say if someone accidentally, you know, out of neglect, you know, and their children, their child is, was killed or something like that, you know, I mean, that's, that's, Extremely traumatic, and you know, it may take a lot, a long time. I mean, God forbid that happened to any of us here, you know. But it's, um, I could imagine that it would just take a long time for people to, to, to overcome it, to, to try to, to forgive themselves. I guess you would say, even though um, that idea of forgiving oneself or not being able to forgive oneself is not necessarily an Islamic concept. But I do think that um, just from a basic uh, um, 
uh, basic just sort of mundane um, sort of uh, um, concern that uh, and you know of of this normal people everyday people it's something that I think that most of us probably would would feel troubled by and about you know if something like that occurred to us you know yeah. yes sir uh, I can sit down for the poem no is today the last session for the poem the, the, oh, the final, yeah, the section, yes, it is, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like, it's the end of our journey. It's like, um, it's the, uh, we prepare for our return to, to God, you know, so it's, you're, it's your, it, it think, think of it like, you, you study, I don't know, martial arts, let's say, for instance, right? You know, you, know, you learn your, your katas, all right, you become a white belt, you know, eventually you become a black belt, right? But once you become a black belt, fundamentally means, okay, you learn, you learn all your kata, you might have perfected most of everything else that came before it, you know, but the aim of, of learning the katas and practicing them is not to just keep learning the katas. The, the aim is for you to, for the art to become um, natural, a natural reflex, Right. So if I'm actually in the encounter, it's like, you know, I don't have to think, you know, because it's like, when I'm learning, I'm learning, okay, I have to do like this and like this. And, uh, you follow me that you're, you know, you got to make sure my arm's like this. Oh, it's not, it's, it's, it has to be like this. Not, it's not enough bend in it. Or you, you, you learn those things when you're in class. And I think it's the same thing with any type of education when you study, when you learn how to write. You learn alphabet and among other, and eventually you study language. You know, it's, eventually you want it to become something which is, is natural, it's is, is, is just simply a reflex. So, so studying basic fiqh, you have your aqidah to correct your, your understanding of God, uh, then you study um, um, your basic um, jurisprudence, you know, to get you some practice in, about ma in, in how to maintain your, your relationship with the creator, but then you go deeper, you dig deeper, and the deeper you dig, the more you become you, the more you start to understand your creator as well, you know, the more understanding of yourself, the more you start to understand of your creator. Not to say that the creator's like you, but it's like, you know, you, there's something that happens, you know, that helps us, you know, to gain a deeper understanding of creator in doing that. So, so and, and if we think of it as, as a, a sort of progression, and then eventually what happens is we return, physically, we return to our creator as well. We want to ensure that our hearts in the right place, and hopefully that when we return, there will be a blissful return. Right, so what do you do, how do you make amends with people if, say for instance, if, if it's somewhat of an intangible type of offense such as backbiting, uh, dis disobedience of parents, or disrespect of parents, and things like that. Um, in, terms of the back, in terms of backbiting, scholars say different things about it. Um, you know, most of the scholars the, the, of, of the soul have actually say that that if you have committed you know an offense against somebody, you've you back you've uh, committed backbiting against someone, that you actually should go to the person and actually seek their forgiveness. Um, that may seem sort of counterintuitive because you would think that okay, well, if I go and let them know, hey, yesterday I just said that you were stupid, you know, and you're dumb and you're ugly and all this other stuff you know, when I was sitting with these people and I want you to forgive me today. And I didn't know that you felt that way about me. You know, now I hear it and it's like, well, you know, I might not want to forgive you. But you can say that fundamentally that's really the point. That that same, there's this sense that the individual is not willing to forgive you and you are made to feel uneasy about their unwillingness to forgive you in this situation is fundamentally part of your purification, right? It's part of your purification. So you, you, you had, distance was created when they didn't know, but further distance is created now, you know, knowingly, and now they don't want to be your friend because they found out you said something uh, about them. Now, on the other hand, the other opinion is that, okay, well, no, don't go to them, don't say anything to them, rather just, Go back to the um, the uh, the group of people and say some some good words about them. Apologize for what you said. Continue to pray for that person. Make you know, uh, among other things. 
you know, that's another way to deal with it. But uh, I think that the, the, first, the first way is um, it demands a high level of, of, uh, of what we call it, zeal, spiritual zeal, realistically, you know, to expect that, uh, you know, that people, you know, to, to, to be ready that people may not forgive you, even though you ask them for their forgiveness. You ask them, you tell them that. Um, with parents, similarly, with parents, you apologize to parents. You know, and I think that with parents, you definitely have to do it. You know, you, you, if you disrespect your parents and you, 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 you make tova, you, you, you apologize to them, you, you start to serve them better, serve them more, uh, um, do things for them, um, you know, lose sleep over them. You know, you know, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the way back. You know, so with parents, definitely. But with other people, maybe it may not be as uh, necessarily as... Uh, Something is 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 important, but it's not as as important as it is, as it is with your parents. <coughs> Helpful. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it, it'll it'll definitely take too, too much time to comment on that, but but there's definitely a, a difference in <coughs> and orders Sufi orders the difference in people's approach to to soul wolf. <coughs> there are um, different. Um, Different, the, the different areas of emphasis with regard to the, um, the overriding motivations that one should have when one worships, worship the Creator. Like, for instance, Imam Ghazali, for instance, he, his position was that, you know, that, the, that fear should be the ultimate um, motivator of you to obey God, <clears throat> at least for most of your life. You know? But if you fall on your deathbed, you get sick, let it be hope. Right. He actually didn't like the fact that that many of the the uh, sermonizers during his time that they inc- they were spoke a lot about God's mercy and forgiveness and things like that. And he felt that it just made people uh, reckless and made them more daring to go out and commit sin. That Imam Ghazali didn't like that. So his method was a method of khof, of fear. <coughs> Some may emphasize shukr, gratitude, for instance. You know that you should do things out of gratitude towards God. You should, you understand? So there's there different, um, different orders may emphasize different sort of motivations that one should have. Uh, but, and also there be, um, there be an emphasis, different emphasis on, um, on um, the law, for instance. You know, some, some orders may not emphasize the law as much as others. You know, some orders they say, well, a, having knowledge of the outward law is extremely important. It's a prerequisite for you in order for you to become a true Sufi. Where others may say, no, the law stuff just merely means anything, you know, this year is, you know, you know, it's not really all that important. You know, it's, it, this is a moral tradition. It's not a legal tradition. You know, so you have those type of uh, discrepancies between different orders. Yeah. Yeah. Time up? Okay. <laughs> All right, Shaw, I appreciate it. And uh, Shaw, let next week we'll continue with um, some more particular examples of, of, uh, of taqwa. You know, so we started, to say, we talked about taqwa just as definition, but then we're going to talk about things of the sins of the eye, the heart, among other things, um, and the, follow, uh, and the uh, following um, inshallah session, inshallah. And I appreciate everybody coming out and hopefully see you again very soon. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وسبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب واتوب اليك وعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وسبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله